Well, welcome to this second portion of our presentation on the lung microbiome. Next, we're going to move into correlating the lung microbiome and the outcome with COVID-19. We live in an unprecedented time with an unpredictable virus that has caused now what has been defined as a pandemic. There's a lot of unknowns that we have. We have fears out there, and the greatest fear is a fear of the unknown. And what I'd like to do in this section of the presentation is to review, again, data that we now have, realizing this is constantly changing almost daily. And I have our infection preventionists here in the audience. And it's almost like we're meeting at least daily, Monday through Friday, and sometimes weekends having the connect, but trying to stay on top of the data. Well, these are the basics of what we now understand about COVID-19. This is caused by a, a virus that was named in mid-February by this nomenclature committee, referred to as SARS, or the uh, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus Type 2. Before that, it had been referred to as 2019 Novel Coronavirus, and we still use that terminology. And the disease was defined as COVID-19, or coronavirus disease in the year 2019. And as we all know, this is a potential for causing severe illness and pneumonia. Case fatality rates of the known and documented, uh, or of the, the people dying in the known cases has been estimated maybe about 0.66, but as we'll come back, there are certain vulnerable individuals where that case fatality rate is much higher. How it spread in general, it was reinforced as it spread maybe like influenza, larger droplets greater than five microns, and defining presently close contact, being within six feet of somebody for greater than 10 minutes. But we now know there's smaller droplet nuclei that are generated. In fact, it's one study suggested we maybe with a sneeze, we can propel infectious droplets like with norovirus when you vomit up to 25 feet. And it can stay in the air for more suspended periods of time, maybe up to three hours or so, kind of depending on the local ventilation uh, system and so on. And then fulmites, we know it can get in the environment on inanimate or non-porous substances like plastic and steel lasts up to two or three days, non-porous substances more like 24 hours. And then this concept that a, a lot of people may be asymptomatic. In fact, studies suggest anywhere from 50 to 78 percent of people out of China when they do the test, which is a nasopharyngeal swab looking for PCR, 50 to 78 percent were asymptomatic at the time. Now, some of those were pre-symptomatic. Uh, and we also know about 80 percent of people that get symptoms have milder disease. But then about 20 percent are getting more severe disease with about five to six percent ending up more critically ill in the critical care unit on, on a ventilator. The symptoms, fever, shortness of breath and cough, incubation period around two to 14 days is still estimated with a median of about five to seven days. We know that certain people are more vulnerable at increased risk. Children seem to be spared for the most part, although there, there's at least one infant that I, I am aware of that died. Uh, COVID-19, but it's those older than 65, some take that down to 60, but it's the comorbidities, the comorbidities, which we'll come back and discuss. And then treatment primarily is supportive care now. We are entering into a study, one of my research coordinators here, Amanda, <laughs> is helping coordinate this with our other infection preventionists, Linda and Rita, that are here, but we're going to be able to offer patients so-called convalescent plasma from patients who have been infected and been able to have them apheresis and then give about 200 mils of this convalescent plasma to patients that we define as being at increased risk for more severe disease or de have, having developed severe disease. And then there's some ongoing studies, remdesivir, hydroxychloroquine with without azithromycin out there, and we're waiting for that data. Well, again, the symptoms, fever, shortness of breath, cough, and there's a spectrum of symptoms. I, there's a nurse that was up on the floor that only developed loss of taste and smell, and she had COVID-19. Uh, although her source appeared to be outside of the hospital reassuringly. 
anorexia, myalgias, and the, that anosmia is a loss of, of, of smell, the dysgeusia, the loss of taste, which can be very striking and profound, and that relates to the virus attacking the olfactory nerve. We have a patient that was hospitalized that we released over the weekend on about day 23 of his disease. He had initially had a rash for a week and they'd given him steroids. And about a week after he had been admitted here, uh, there were case reports beginning to appear in the dermatology literature about rash also associated with this disease. We should add GI symptoms, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain have also been associated with this disease. And the, sh the shedding issue, and this is going to be viewed on a video, so there's some complex slides like this, and I'll allow you to just pause and study some of these. But in general, the specimens we're obtaining are nasal pharyngeal swabs. You can see potentially found in the conjunctival swabs, sputum. As the university has recently shared with us, the highest viral loads are within the, about the time you're becoming symptomatic, a day or so before, and then that first week, and then after that first week, the amount of virus in the upper respiratory tract is diminishing, but it's increasing in the lower respiratory tract, especially in those individuals that are getting more severe disease. The structure of the virus, you've probably heard of the concept that this is a coronavirus, that these spikes, uh, especially the so-called S uh, spike protein here, uh, kind of the spikes of a, of a crown, and thus it was uh, name coronavirus because of that crown-like appearance. Within the, the structure of that virus is its single-stranded uh, RNA that is associated with that nucleocapsid protein, and uh, this is then housed in a lipid bilayer envelope, a lipid bilayer envelope. So what we now understand, there's several receptors, but the one that has gained much of the attention is this so-called ACE2 receptor that we have in our alveoli on that um, uh, one uh, type 2 alveolar cell. We also have these receptors throughout our body, including the gastrointestinal tract. And this spike protein, or that S protein, it likes to dock with this receptor. And then upon docking, can then enter into the cell and then replicate. So into the eye of the cytokine storm. The concept that this virus can enter in, if we have a functioning, healthy immune system, it's believed that we can stop this virus in its tracks, so to speak. We should have natural roaming cytotoxic T cells, natural killer cells that are identifying a cell that's infected and the danger signal sent out and can eliminate those infected cells and the virus so it can't replicate. But there's a certain group of individuals, we'll, which we'll be discussing, get into a cytokine storm, an intense, an exaggerated inflammatory response. It's like a tornado that is approaching us. And are we going to be hit by the tornado or not? Are we going to be thrust into the turbulence of the winds of that tornado? Are we going to end up with a cytokine storm, if you will? and perhaps being thrust into more of a tsunami or the perfect storm. I like these quotes, and this was actually uh, Todd Lapine uh, presented some of these slides that I'm sharing with you that Mark Hyman recently did a, a webinar on COVID-19. If you know Mark, he presented it several years ago at the public health or public television where you could donate and, uh, and he would send you his whole program. At that time, I think he was on the 13th book. He's now published two or three other books, but that book was Eat Fat, Get Thin. Uh, his more recent book is What the Heck Should I Cook? And the book before that is What the Heck Should I Eat? Uh, and he directs the functional medicine program at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, and these quotes taken uh, from the Washington Post, once inside a cell, a virus can make 10,000 copies of itself in a matter of hours. Within a few days, the infected person will carry hundreds of millions of viral particles in every teaspoon of the blood if left unchecked. Andrew uh, Pekoch, a virologist at John Hopkins compared viruses to a particularly destructive burglar. They break into your home, 
eat your food, use your furniture, and have 10,000 babies. And then they leave the place trashed. Well, one of the other evolving concepts, not only do we create this cytokine storm in certain individuals that can lead to this inflammatory process going in the lung, and as, we'll, as you can conceptualize, we'll change our lung microbiome. That This is a recent public, well, it was an unedited accepted proof um, in the process of being peer reviewed, but we now understand that COVID produce, uh, COVID-19 produces a pneumonia, and there's actually two phenotypes to be aware of. A type L phenotype, uh, referred to as the low elastance, versus the more typical ARDS, which is the type H phenotype. And what our pulmonologists have been learning is, and there's three factors that lead to hypoxia. As you're probably aware, there's a VQ mismatch, there is shunting, blood shunting, or there is a diffusion abnormality. And what is happening, the patients coming in, they found that by increasing oxygen, they could sometimes quickly reverse the hypoxemia because of diffusion abnormalities versus in the typical ARDS, often they were requiring higher pressures to push the fluid out, but it turned out that these patients are not doing as well on the ventilator, and, and there's a lot of uh, details behind all that, but suffice it to say that our pulmonologists are being put to the challenge to how do they address this respiratory failure in patients, the ventilator or not, the settings of the ventilator, and so on, and again, addressing two different phenotypes of pneumonia here. Well, as, as you know, if we look at people dying of COVID-19, it has been associated with age, as shown here, especially as you begin to get seasoned, if you will, older than 60, uh, approaching maybe about 15% in those 80 years of age or older. But perhaps more importantly, maybe it's not age, but is it the underlying health of the individual? Is it an underlying chronic medical condition, which we know is associated with chronic inflammation that is perhaps more important. And as you can see here, the increased chance of dying of COVID-19, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic respiratory disease, hypertension, cancer, versus no pre-existing condition, 0.9%. So warning, there are vulnerable patients and as we come back and remodel this whole pandemic based on the data, I am really proposing, especially to our, those at the state health department level, they need to be addressing this concept. Or if we're going to get back to reversing this really a devastating effect on our economy, we've got to begin to think of how are we going to get back to being more normal? And I think that's going to come through how do we protect those that are more vulnerable until we have herd immunity up to 60% or a vaccine perhaps or some documented antiviral? A question we could ask, why do these chronic diseases serve as a risk factor for dying of COVID-19? Well, it turns out m many, if not all, are diseases of our metabolism, met metabolic dysfunction. And they travel with a BMI greater than 30, but Rob Lustig, if you've never listened to any presentations by Rob Lustig, you, you really need to just Google him. He is a pediatric neuroendocrinologist, a pediatric neuroendocrinologist out of California. And it's been about 10 years ago, he had a TED talk called The Bitter Truth, The Bitter Truth. And that's a good presentation to start with. But I'm gonna share with you some of his concepts of what the bitter truth is behind metabolic dysfunction. Well, th these are pretty well set criteria now. The metrics of the metabolic syndrome, if you have three of these five, three or more, these five, you are defined as having now what we call a metabolic syndrome. This includes prediabetes or diabetes, a fasting blood sugar greater than 100 or hemoglobin A1C that's elevated, hypertension, too much belly tissue, <laughs> BMI greater than 30, triglycerides, elevated, HDL, depressed. 
So being overweight, though, is not the cause, as Rob Lustig likes to point out, because 20% of people overweight don't have the metabolic syndrome. But it turns out, at this point in time, 40% of people who are normal weight or just overweight, BMIs of 18.5 up to about 29.9, they have metabolic dysfunction. And thus, he likes to present this slide of 240 million adults, that if you look at those that are BMI greater than 30, and then you look at those that are normal to just overweight, that you actually end up having more people in this category that have metabolic dysfunction, or 67 million. So what is metabolic dysfunction? What is it? What is it a marker of? Well, he believes that this is a marker that if you have metabolic dysfunction, you have insulin resistance. And insulin is a very critical hormone in regulating our body's metabolism. It actually helps regulate our immune function. And I've historically, going back to my days when I lectured about diabetes with our family practitioners, I always pointed out you have the primary defense against infection being skin and your mucous membranes. But the second line of defense are your neutrophils, your neutrophils. And if you're pre-diabetic or diabetic, have elevated blood sugars, your neutrophils are dysfunctional. And recent research suggests it's because of the following. Neutrophils to function effectively need to take up vitamin C. And if you look at the tissue fluid surrounding a neutrophil, a neutrophil has 50-fold greater concentration of vitamin C, which is very critical in the neutrophil function, the antioxidant properties, and so on. Now, if you've got elevated sugar, what the neutrophil does, it says, I'm going to take up the sugar. I'm going to be happy. It's a happy uh, molecule, of course, uh, that it, in, and not taking up the vitamin C in a, as great a concentration. So you get dysfunctional neutrophils is hypothesized related to that mechanism. So inability of cells to function normally with insulin. In fact, insulin is a storage hormone. If you can't reverse insulin resistance, you can't lose weight. So one of the critical steps in losing weight is reversing insulin resistance. And then finally, also the concept of mitochondrial dysfunction. All our cells have these little engines except for red blood cells in them. Neurons will have up to 2,000 of these neurons. A heart has uh, increased density of these mitochondria. Mitochondria make our energy, our ATP. So every time we're eating, we're actually eating to feed our mitochondria. But when our bodies are under stress, under chronic inflammation, the signals that are sent out, and we believe many times maybe coming from the gastrointestinal tract or potentially anywhere in the body, danger signals are sent out throughout our body to our cells and specifically to our mitochondria. And they turn from making energy into the danger response and communicating with our immune response, time to activate, and then leading to chronic inflammation. And you get fatigue, tiredness, and other symptoms. So mitochondria dysfunction is a whole concept we could spend the rest of the day on, but just be aware that the mitochondria dysfunction is an intense area of scientific research right now. So why do these chronic diseases serve as a risk factor for dying from COVID-19? Well, with chronic medical conditions, you're in a chronic inflammatory state. It's kind of like there's a fire burning, and then you come along and dump all this extra fuel on it, or COVID-19. And the next thing you know, you have this cytokine storm that potentially can lead to the perfect storm. So your inflammatory status is the single best predictor of survival, is hypothesized. So if you're in good health, do not have chronic medical conditions, as you can see, that was correlated with a lower risk of dying of COVID-19. But the correlation, and we believe maybe even the causation factor here, is this chronic inflammation, chronic medical conditions, and then COVID-19 comes along and worsens the inflammation. And what worsens the inflammation? Process foods. Processed foods is a unifying hypothesis. So let's look at this a little more closely. Processed foods, according to Rob Lustig, is big, three inherent problems that we see with processed foods. Excess omega-6 fatty acids, which are pro-inflammatory. 
lack of omega-3s or oily fish, which are anti-inflammatory. And, and some like Barry Sears, who's written the book The Zone and a, a number of books, believes that that ratio of omega-3 to omega-6 is critical in determining if you have ongoing chronic inflammation or not. And then finally, excess sugar. Virtually all processed foods has added sugar, or fructose, or fructose, uh, which is a sweet molecule in sugar that poisons our mitochondria and induces insulin resistance directly. Because as we know, uh, and we'll come back and discuss, fructose can only be metabolized in your liver cells, only in the liver cells. And when it's metabolized, you make triglycerides, get fatty liver. What's the leading cause of liver transplantation? A few years ago, initially in women, and now maybe even men, is fatty liver or non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. So could it be that Rob Lustig is right, that fructose is the cause of fatty liver? Indeed, in, a, in addition to producing triglycerides, which is a harmful fat, we also know we increase uric acid, uh, which can lead to gout. It also increases these so-called reactive oxygen species, or oxidative molecules that lead to inflammation. I like this concept that sugar, cocaine, and alcohol share, three, or share two properties. They're addictive and they're toxic, addictive and toxic, especially taken in excess. Now, a little wine here and there may not hurt you. A little sugar here and there may not, but think in terms of excess addiction toxicity. So how can I protect myself from COVID-19 with this background of data that we now know is there and exists? Well, if we initially look at our traditional guidelines now through the CDC, and we always encourage everybody to go to cdc.gov COVID-19 to stay up to date on this evolving data that we have, but washing hands with soap and water uh, or an alcohol-based hand hygiene, avoiding close contact, again, we've traditionally, or have stated six feet, uh, especially if somebody's sick, avoiding touching your face with unwashed hands, and then following again national guidelines, including from the CDC and our state health department. Um, so the whole concept is social distancing. Uh, the CDC website, Nebraska Health Department, the PPE, and we met yesterday with our group again, kind of addressing the various issues here because this is how we're trying to protect our healthcare workers. The healthcare workers are on the front line, and our, one of our priorities is to keep our healthcare workers well, to keep them well with PPE. But could it be that we also need to share this knowledge with everybody that maybe immune support also is equally as important? equally as important because we can protect you in the work setting and maybe you can wear a mask if you go to the grocery store, but is there still going to be on exposure outside of the workplace? How do I keep from spreading illness to others if I'm sick? And then these guidelines again on the CDC or Nebraska Health Department website say home when you're sick, uh, cough etiquette, uh, cleaning of the environment, and if you're sick, calling ahead before you go in to see your healthcare worker to protect them. And I, I like this slide that uh, Todd Lapine presented. Be like this little piggy. Uh, you know, the little rhyme, this piggy went to market, this little piggy stayed at home. So think in terms of when do you need to stay at home? So active topics of investigation then, does lung dysbiosis contribute or is it a marker of injury and inflammation in COVID-19? Can restoration of a healthy functional core gut and lung microbiome shield us against SARS-CoV-2? And can the lung microbiome be manipulated therapeutically in COVID-19? And in sharing some of the questions with Bob Lustig, he kind of sent me, email within a few hours. I, I think he was kind of excited that there's an ID doctor would be out there uh, since he's kind of a, he's a pulmonologist. And then kind of reinforcing, he sent me some good updated information. And these areas are all being actively looked at, not only by his group, but other groups around the country. But could immune support through maintaining a hel healthy, balanced microbiome be important? And I, I ran this checklist by him, and he, he kind of reinforced, you know, we don't have good randomized double-blinded studies behind all this, but I thought I would just go down this checklist briefly with you, kind of sharing with you my opinion. Again, I'm not trying to recommend or diagnose, but just to contemplate, again, 
what we understand about the data we presented, which may help you survive this COVID-19. And first of all, if the lung microbiome comes from our mouth, it only makes sense, common sense, that you need to look at oral hygiene. You can control what you can control. Now you can influence, maybe you're more at an influence level of what you can influence, and it's been likened if, you, if you're concerned and worried, you got this outer circle, and then you got the influence circle, and then you got the inner control circle. So work on what can you influence by what we've already reviewed, but also look at which inner circle you can control. And as you expand those influence and control circles, you decrease your worry factor. You decrease stress. So look at what you can control. And I think you've got to look at, now look at your toothpaste. And I, I start out with our patients now, eliminate all the toxins out of your, your life not only in foods, but also in your healthcare personal products. Start looking at toothpaste. Get an app, like Healthy Living uh, app, and look at what's in your toothpaste. You'll be amazed sometimes that you may be giving yourself dysbiotic oral microbiome and in return a dysbiotic lung microbiome. There's oral probiotics out there, uh, which you can look at. This is actually my area of research. When I was a fellow, I went in and looked at what's called, we call it bacterial interference back then. I did all these, uh, a large group of twin families looking at bacteria, specifically a beard and strep, strep salivaris, how it inhibited the growth of group A strep in the laboratory and looking at uh, how it prevented development of group A strep disease. And now they've got an oral probiotic out there. Uh, I got sidetracked with antibiotic and antibiotic resistance, but again, reinforcing that the oral pharyngeal microbiome is perhaps the starting point in understanding how we can protect our lung microbiome. A group of patients we deal with, we reinforce you if you've got acute or chronic rhinosinusitis, you've got to have maximum medical management of that through sinus irrigations. We actually have probiotic rinses we give our patients now because if you have an ongoing active inflammatory disease or infection in the upper respiratory tract, we know that increases your risk of translocation then of, of some of these pathobionts like Haemophilus and Moraxel into the lung and Streptococcus pneumoniae, and then you can end up with pneumonia. I think you need to address GERD and uh, the potential of aspiration since you could be refluxing, especially if you're on a proton pump inhibitor, you get overgrowth of bacteria, and that's those bacteria because you're still refluxing on those agents. But that doesn't really take care of the mechanical problem. It decreases your awareness of the reflux because it decreases the acid, but you're still potentially going to get reflux and aspiration. And then optimizing pulmonary hygiene is in this. And then finally, restoring and rebalancing the functional core gut microbiome through diet and lifestyle modification, which again, my, it's my opinion that that is gonna be a very key area in immune support as we continue to work through this COVID-19. So let's look at some of the foundational concepts here. We'll start with the environment, the environment including food. Uh, are you under stress or not? Are you getting sleep? Are you moving? Are you getting good social interaction? And the, again, the food you're putting in your mouth are all, all sort of concepts of environment. Are you consuming toxins? Or are you being exposed to toxins? And the environment then interacts with our epigenome. And the epigenome came out of the research initially with the genomic project and then the microbiome project. What we learned is because we, we only had 20,000 genes, but what is now important are these genes turned on or off? Are they upregulated, downregulated? Is the inflammatory gene, is it upregulated, downregulated? That really are critical in determining health, it appears. So the epigenetics, another intense area of research. And then finally, you could guess it, the interacting microbiome, microbiome, which then interacts with all those environmental factors, environmental factors interacting with our microbiome. Whatever you eat determines your microbiome. Are you giving it artificial sweeteners that kills off 50% of our microbiome, like saccharin, aspartame, and so on? That's not good. Are you eating foods that have glyphosate or Roundup in them? The non-organic foods, it also kills off our microbiome. Are you taking medications and so on? So the environment factors all interact. And we also know if you're not getting adequate sleep, that somehow affects our microbiome. If you're not moving, that affects our microbiome. If you're not getting out and walking in the trees, 
the Japanese call it force bathing. That seems to also affect our microbiome. We now know studies in the last month or so looked at the phytocytes, as they call it, and that apparently that's how we interact with the trees, and that stimulates good natural killer cell and cytotoxic T cell function. And in return, that seems a signal to our microbiome, all is calm, carry on. And then finally, life is in right the middle of those three intersecting circles of environment, epigenetics, and microbiome. And then surrounding all that is our consciousness, our spirit, what goes beyond quantum physics, which is really an exciting area. Begin to look, yeah, there, there is something to all that. There is a God. And again, beyond our purposes of going into that, but that can all control those inner circles then. Well, let's look then at some of the basic, again, foundational principles with that as a background. So we have these chronic inflammatory diseases, how they appear. You've got diabetes, you've got cardiovascular disease, maybe you've got depression, you've got an autoimmune disease, which are the, kind of the leaves of this growing tree, if you will. But then there's some of these core metabolic imbalances that seems to be driving these chronic inflammatory diseases, the inflammation, we know the stress response, the catecholamines again, uh, the mitochondrial disruption, insulin resistance, and then that concept of intestinal permeability. And then finally, what are the root causes? What could be the unifying root causes? What are the origins behind the metabolic imbalances leading to the chronic inflammatory diseases? And that's the interaction of those three circles, the epigenetics, the environment, the microbiome the nutrition, the movement, stress responses, environmental toxins, sleep, social connection, trauma, conflict management, stress management, meaning in work, love, and play can all be important factors or root causes driving this is what's hypothesized. So we're in a day and age growing ugly trees, growing amounts of chronic inflammatory diseases Going back to 1950, you can see skyrocketing various type 1 diabetes. It's estimated maybe one in uh, two Americans now have prediabetes or diabetes uh, related to the metabolic dysfunction, the growing weight of being uh, a BMI greater than 30 or being overweight. And, and actually, if you add an overweight, this is approaching about 70 75 percent now. And dying then has switched from infectious diseases to these non communicable diseases to where the CDC estimated in 2017, as you can see, over 640,000 people died of cardiovascular disease. Uh, around 600,000 died of malignancy or cancers. So what is underlying all this? Alicio Fasano, and I alluded to him, he again, is at Mass General in the, uh, in, at Children's Hospital there. And he discovered, again, zonulin that opens up these tight junctions in our gut. And this is a model that they published back in 2016, the proposed mechanism for the development of chronic inflammatory diseases in children. What is happening to our children? Why in 150 children have autism now? One in 50, according to the CDC. What is behind this? And Alicio feels very strongly this is centered around changes in our microbiome composition. It, part of this is a hygiene hypothesis. Maybe we have too sterile of an environment. We're not letting our children get out and eat dirt and play you know, with the dogs and so on uh, to stimulate and help our immune system develop normally. And what they have documented is alteration of the gut wall permeability. Again, zonulin being released with certain foods and stresses and toxins and so on. And those openings are just not closing like they should be normally. And this, he believes, and their group, as they're doing research, all breaks down to these chronic inflammatory diseases, dysbiosis, leaky gut, and probably a genetic predisposition thrown in here. So changes in microbiome composition. The secret killer, the chronic inflammation, as time had shown here in this publication, the surprising link between inflammation and chronic inflammatory diseases, chronic inflammation, associated with an origin in the gut. So let's look at what's happening to our society. Well, this is a uh, study that was published looking at the human lifespan. Again, our microbiome, especially in the gut, is pretty well established by three years of life. And the changes in diversity and the richness 
the composition over a lifetime. As you can see, as we get seasoned and we get into ongoing chronic perturbations, decreasing our resistance, resilience, this is at least correlated with decreasing diversity composition. And as we get into maybe even at age 50, we begin to get into what's called immunosenescence. Our immune system seems to be aging related to this chronic inflammation, all these perturbances, and we get into what has been called inflama aging, inflama aging, behind the aging that we're seeing in our society. So our gut ecosystem is losing diversity, losing diversity. High diversity gut microbiome is associated with better health versus a low diversity gut microbiome as compared to this tropical jungle versus this devastated land where you could imagine the amount of living organisms there has been really depleted significantly. And this low diversity in the gut microbiome is correlated with chronic inflammatory disease. So chronic disease, our approach, a pill for an ill, we are trying to cut off the branches of this growing ugly tree. I kind of like this cartoon. Great news, Captain, you can inform the passengers we have slowed the rate of sinking. But nevertheless, the chronic conditions continue to increase. So could there be a unifying theory? Well, many in this area who are doing research acknowledging there could be multiple factors, but it's felt that diet may be the unifying theory here behind this explosion of chronic inflammatory conditions. You know, a number of lifestyles may affect immune function. We've mentioned the stress, a lack of movement, excessive alcohol consumption, anything in excess, but it may well be our poor diet that is behind much of the immune dysfunction. So the shape of things to come, the shape of things to come, the road we've been on is this road as shown here. People bring donuts in the work, they bring cake and cookies. And the, the message I want to give you, little sugar isn't harmful, but again, anything in excess may be toxic to our system. And we go back to the Sonnenberg's lab. If you remember that picture I showed you that they do research. And in, in fact, this is from the mouse, but the same uh, appearance is seen with a human colon. So here's the colonocytes, the host cells. Uh, you can see the microbiome here. And again, this is fiber, fiber. Now, you, there's both insoluble and soluble fiber, but both can get into the colon and feed our bacteria. Soluble fiber is the, what absorbs water and it becomes like a gel-like and it actually it sets up kind of a, a web so you can slow down absorption of sugar. So fruit with both fiber and sugar, it's, it's not always bad because you're going to get decreased surges of sugar into your system. But both soluble and soluble fiber gets into the colon. And again, you look at the mucus, a nice healthy fence here. Now, if they starve those bacteria, give them a lot of, sh or starve these mice, and give them a lot of sugar without fiber, you can see you've lost, here's very little fiber, and what's happening here? You're losing your fence or you're losing your protected mucus barrier. And they've associated that with chronic disease. So this is the hypothesis that if you have increased microbiota accessible carbohydrates, which is your soluble and soluble fiber, you can get, maintain good diversity, uh, healthy metabolic output, and protection from these chronic inflammatory diseases. So your bacteria in your colon, we've had outsourced metabolizing and digesting this fiber to our bacteria. They have over 25,000 genes for digesting fiber versus we have very few genes for digesting fiber. But what, we are, what we're good at with a diet high in sugars such as this cake, we readily absorb these sugars, especially if there's not the presence of soluble fiber to decrease the absorption. So decrease microbiota as accessible carbohydrates, the max, as I would call it. So you want to eat a, a Big Mac, but not the type you get down the street at the Golden Arches. But if you have decreased Mac intake, you have decreased microbiota diversity and decreased metabolic output and chronic inflammatory diseases like we're seeing in the Western world. 
And there's four processed nutrient deficient foods that have changed our world's diet. And, and it's sad, but not only in the United States, but now around the world, they're seeing this happen. The addition of refined added sugars, refined grains such as wheat or white wheat flour, and the so-called PUFAs, polyunsaturated seed oils or vegetable oils that are high in omega-6. And these artificially created trans fats or hydrogenated fats that are toxic to our cells. And this is kind of a timeline for processed foods. Chris Noby has presented a lot of good science behind this. He's actually an ophthalmologist. And his mission is to help people understand why in the year 1900, we very rarely saw macular degeneration. Fast forward to this year, if you're 75 years of age, one in three chance of having macular degeneration. And I would challenge you to go and just look him up and listen to some of his presentation. I've just kind of uh, edited some of his slides, but he presents his timeline. Sugar increases here. Uh, addition of seed oils, uh, addition of Crisco in 1911, which I grew up with. And when I was younger, my mother thought, wow, this is better than lard. Little did we know, no, no, it was the other way around because of the trans fats that we were eating. And so now we're up to 63% of our diet is processed foods with toxic substances being added, additives, sugar, seed oils. And there's trans fats in the the background because they don't need to report trans fats are uh, that are present if it's less than 5%. So look at the sugar consumption, the growth of the sugar industry, stabilization, processed food, and then look with our dietary guidelines, what happened? Promoting increased carb intake over fats. The consumption continued to increase. So if we look at sugar, sucrose, table sugar versus, and high fructose corn syrup, which is derived from cone, corn, both have glucose and fructose, as Rob pronounces it, or fructose, often pronounced around here. But it's the fructose, again, that can only be metabolized in the liver. And this gets very complex, but suffice it to say, this basically, if you're eating too much fructose in the form of table sugar or even fruit, that you're going to end up potentially with a fatty liver, increased triglycerides, increased uric acid is shown here, uh, and leading to insulin resistance. Vegetable oil consumption, as you can see here, back in 1900, 99% of added fats were from animal fat, but here we went from zero vegetable seed oil. These are the oils made in big industrial plants, such as canola oil. Um, so we went, ended up now, 86% of added fats are from these seed oils or vegetable oils polyunsaturated vegetable oils as shown here, corn, canola, and again, many of us grew up with these, Can canola, uh, corn oil. And what he has studied that all these are readily oxidized, especially when we're cooking, but even before the cooking process of heating them up. They're pro-oxidative, pro-inflammatory, cytotoxic, genotoxic, mutagenic, carcinogenic, thrombogenic, and atherogenic poisons. And he believes this is in part why we have one in three Americans at the age of 75 that have macular generation now, because of what it's doing to our cells. That if you're eating French fries that are cooked in these seed oils, you're eating what's called acrolein. Acrolein, that's that substance produced from glycerol when you heat fats to their heating point. And that smell, that kind of bad smell, that's acrolein that you're smelling. That is toxic to our cells, and it may, may not be necessarily carcinogenic, but we know it's toxic. In fact, his research has shown that the content in 154 grams of French fries is equivalent to smoking anywhere from 17 to 26 average cigarettes, or if you've got low acrolein cigarettes, it's like smoking 83 cigarettes at one time, acrolein. So, would you give your child a poison? Well, it turns out is, and what he hypothesized, is giving a child French fries cooked in these seed oils where just one of the many toxins would be acrolein with a half-life of 600 to 680 days. Could you be poisoning your child for the next two to six years? 
And could this be a factor behind autism, other chronic diseases that are striking our children, including diabetes? High poop of vegetable oils are, is the added fat of choice now to most processed and restaurant foods. So it's really difficult to even go out and eat and not eat a PUFA. So if foods or products were honestly labeled, such as here, uh, chemical helper, uh, zero nutrient puffs, heart disease spread, colon cancer dogs, uh, for sure diabetes drink, would we be a healthier population? But it comes back to risk versus benefit. <laughs> risk versus benefit. I think we're always in as we going through this COVID-19, we're always having to assess risk over benefit. As Hippocrates said, and it's my opinion that our food should be our medicine and our medicine should be our food. And I kind of look at this, I'm a, I'm a gardener, I'm trying to nourish a healthy microbiota. How do I nourish a healthy microbiota? Well, I think it's for foods. And I think if you look at the various national guidelines, we all agree that we should be eating a healthier diet, more vegetables, more fruits, increased dietary fiber. Fiber is an important part of a healthy diet and you should get at least 20 grams a day, but often we're only getting down to about five or 10 grams a day versus uh, undeveloped uh, areas of the world like in Africa, they're eating up to 150 grams of fiber, which is associated with not having these chronic inflammatory diseases. So Tim Spector has written a, uh, about this whole area, and I, I like to quote him, recent research has shown that the gut microbiome plays an essential role in the body's immune response to infection and maintaining overall health, as well as mounting a response to infectious pathogens like coronavirus. A healthy gut microbiome also helps to prevent potentially dangerous immune overreactions that can damage the lungs and other vital organs. So again, a healthy, balanced, gut microbiome, and I like to refer to it as a healthy, functional core microbiome. What is it doing? What is it communicating throughout our body? And this is the one book he's written, The Diet Myth. And his recommendations at the checkout is we are all different and each of us responds to food differently. Foods high in sugars and processed foods are bad for our microbes and for our health. Feed your microbiota, nourish your microbiota with the max or the microbiota accessible carbohydrates and diets high in vegetables and, and, and maybe some fruit, which are high in both soluble and insoluble fiber, kind of the rainbow then of foods. Michael Pollan, some of you may have read some of his book. He's a journalist, and this is one of an older book that he advocated, and many still endorse eating wholesome foods, real foods, mostly plants, and sensible combinations, and not too much. Don't eat anything your grandmother's microbes would not recognize this food. Now, if it's got a label on it, it probably she wouldn't recognize it as food. So be careful with anything with a label on it. The more diverse your wholesome diet is, the more diverse is your healthy functional core microbiota or microbiome. So real food is your best defense, is what Rob Lustig is telling us. Nutrient-dense, minerals, vitamins, also flavonoids, polyphenols seem to be very important in helping maintain a healthy gut and healthy immune system. I'll just reference this. If you want to know more about immune function and micronutrient requirements, this article by Magini is an excellent review and it goes through all the important micronutrients that are essential for immune competence, especially vitamins A, C, D, E, B2, B6, and B12, folic acid, iron, selenium, and zinc. And we know that micronutrient deficiencies impair our immune systems. And she goes through the importance maybe of considering at least eating macronutrients high in these vitamins and minerals. And if you feel you're not getting adequate nutrient replenishment, consider supplements. So to conclude with, let's just look at some basic, uh, so, some checklists of what you could do as an individual based on the data that we reviewed. And uh, again, trying to support these conclusions with the data we reviewed. Well, first of all, getting restorative sleep is very important. If you get less than seven hours, we know that impairs your cytotoxic T cells and your, your natural killer cells. So get sleep, get sleep. And then avoid toxins. Toxins that we take in can really throw off our microbiome. 
Uh, so look at personal care products, the foods you're eating, and so on. First thing in the morning, we always tell our patients, hydrate. You're 10% dehydrated. You need good water intake. And again, hopefully water that doesn't have toxins in it. I advocate our patients the three M's in the morning, meditation, spending some time, with maybe doing some deep breathing at least, some mindfulness, some prayer, moving on to just a few minutes of just basic exercise, jogging in place, some squats, especially if you're seasoned like me. I, you know, that I find pretty important to get moving for a few minutes. And then your mindset and what, they, what is meant by that is give gratitude at that point. It's giving gratitude can really change your body's metabolism and your, your mindset, so to speak. So give gratitude and set out a goal for the day. And at the end of the day, did I accomplish my goal? And again, give gratitude is important. And the emphasis, again, on nutrient-dense, whole foods, nutrient-dense. Uh, again, supporting your immune system. I would limit alcohol during this period of time. Alcohol is toxic. Uh, maybe a glass of wine still, but again, I, I even get concerned now with, with the COVID-19. And then finally, maybe having to do some dietary supplements. I think vitamin D is critically important. In the next presentation we were going to do in a, a month or two is kind of really look, looking at some of the science behind these micronutrients. Because we know there's a good meta-analysis of 11,000 people out there a couple years ago go that was published in the United Kingdom, 50% decrease in viral respiratory infection, infections if you had been deficient in vitamin D and then replaced vitamin D. Vitamin C is important, again, for maintaining that neutrophil function we mentioned. Uh, vitamin A is also very important in maintaining especially the lining of the gut and our immune system. Now, be careful with vitamin A. You can overdo it. Uh, if you eat too much polar bear liver, for example, you can get vitamin A toxic. Uh, zinc. Um, is important in maintaining our immune system. Now, some would throw quercetin, it's an ionophore, it helps increase zinc in the cells. Now, there's one study going on with quercetin now. You get quercetin in a lot of foods. Elderberry, uh, nurses will ask me about that. There are actually, in the last year or so, some studies on influenza that elderberry did have an antiviral effect in the lab. We can't say in the, the human, but boy, elderberry uh, is relatively healthy. And then finally, what role probiotics may play here. And then I always advocate a lot of vitamin L, a lot of vitamin L. Uh, and my grandson, uh, who's 10, wrote me a letter recently. And I wrote back and kind of gave him an update on what was going on. I said, be sure you share a lot of vitamin L with your family. And vitamin L, of course, is love, love. So again, two slides are just a real brief checklist of science-backed ways to biohack your microbiome and gut health. So think in terms of cutting things out that are toxic, avoiding damaging foods and behaviors, sugar, artificial sweeteners. Again, a little here and there. I, I'm, I might have a little chocolate brownie here or there. But again, think in terms of avoiding excess intake. The refined grains have been so chemically modified that they open up these tight junctions and let the hordes in, so to speak. So, Boy, you know, patients that have chronic inflammation, we say, you know, you've, uh, you know, humor me and do an elimination diet, cutting out all the grain, at least gluten, if not all the grains for a while, uh, added sugars. We've gone over the industrial vegetable oils and trans fatty acid issue. That, take a closer look at that, what uh, Chris Noby has presented. Uh, there's certain genetic predispositions like the autoimmune disease where certain foods high in lectins, for example, like peanuts, cashews, beans, and um, dark shades, if not prepared or cooked appropriately, and you probably can't cook a peanut or cashew to get this out, but those may trigger inflammatory responses in those given individuals. Phytates are added to certain foods, oxalates, and so-called mycotoxins is an emerging area of, of intense study. Genetically modified organisms, uh, many times contain, and the reason they were genetically modified, so they can use Roundup on the crop, and then you get Roundup ingestion, and that knocks off your, your microbiome. Preservatives and emulsifiers also affect your microbiome. Antibiotics, we know, and these drugs, and stress, and adequate sleep, and then smoking. So how can you boost your microbiome, your gut health? And I would propose helping give you immune support. Immune support, I think, is so critical now in this pandemic of the uncertainties we're facing. But control what you can control. 
and as we see patients, if they're having GI disturbances, I, as from an infectious disease perspective, we're always looking for potential pathogens, hel helicobacter or a gastrointestinal pathogen panel. Uh, SIBO is a growing problem, and we're getting more and more ref referrals. One of the second, I think it was the second paper I wrote, is a fellow was actually with SIBO, was a patient that had a salamander, and ended up, we aspirated a small bowel and grew out Plesiomonas shigalloides. And I had to go back and say, do you have any funny pets? And he said, yeah, salamander. <laughs> and that carries Plesiomonas. We gave him back to him, he got all better. But that was a SIBO, and in fact, it's reference. I was kind of humored that in a Mandel, our Bible of infectious diseases, they actually referenced that paper as a, an example of unusual causes of SIBO. But in, uh, so Viome is one of the companies that'll give you a microbiome and uh, looking at um, digestive uh, stool analysis, uh, some companies offer it. Kind of, some of these I still think are kind of research, but they're getting closer to telling you what they're doing in addition to what's going on. We talked about getting out in the nature, walking in the forest, intermittent fasting. Whenever you're eating, think of four things. How you're eating, make sure you're getting your digestive juices going, maybe a little prayer, humming, singing, so on. Maybe a little sauerkraut, apple cider vinegar, that gets your digestive juices going. And then when you're eating, more and more we're looking at time-restricted eating, maybe eating in a, like a six, eight hour period of time and the health benefits there. And then what you're eating becomes a third parameter. And then finally, how much you're eating. To me, that follows everything else. Adequate sleep, just exercising the right amount of time to stimulate your cytotoxic T cells Studies have suggested exercising daily for about 20 to 45 minutes. That includes walking around up to about 60%. You don't want to overexert, it turns out. Stick to a schedule, a circadian rhythm, going to bed at the same time, waking up at the same time. Getting a pet, getting a pet that can share with you good vibes, so to speak, good microbiomes or a, a good microbiota. Keep your so-called home xenobiome. And this is a term we didn't really define, but the xenobiome refers not only to your bacteria, but all the bacteria in your surrounding environment, which you're interacting with, as it turns out. And there's an app called Healthy Living App to see what toxins you're being exposed to that may affect your xenobiome. Choose local organic veggies if possible. There's a Dirty Dozen app so you can say, yeah, this food's high in Roundup or glyphosate, and I want to avoid that. And opting for a vaginal birth related to uh, pregnancy and breastfeeding are all very important in helping develop a healthy microbiome for your child. Fermented foods, personally, I like to make my own sauerkraut, my own yogurt, so I get good fermented foods that way. And eating a rainbow of max, the max of microbiota, accessible carbohydrates. And then finally, in the area that we could spend maybe the rest of the day on prebiotics, probiotics, supplements, and finally, fecal microbiota transplant, maybe as a way of hacking your microbiome. But usually, we, we uh, we're, uh, have an ongoing study now with open biome with C. difficile, and that's what we're kind of limiting FMT to. So some of the key messages, if we go back to the first section of this presentation, that the microbial ecosystems of the gut and the lungs change substantially in critically ill patients, including that would be our COVID-19 patients that are becoming more critically ill. And this results in dramatic changes to our microbiome or bacterial communities. And animal studies of shock, the microbial contents of the gut determine the severity of multi-organ failure and the risk of death. An observation supported by trials of selective manipulation, selective decontamination of the gut microbiome in human beings. The mechanisms that drive gut-derived sepsis are incompletely understood and probably multifactorial, offering numerous unexplored therapeutic targets. During lung injury, the bacterial ecosystem, the alveolus, shifts to a state of abundance of nutrients and growth promoting host stress signals, leading to a positive feedback loop of ongoing inflammation, more dysbiosis, more inflammation, and sometimes, unfortunately, the perfect cytokine storm. The microbiome is a key therapeutic target for the prevention of treatment of critical illness, and it should be included in any discussion of precision medicine in the critical care. And then finally, the final take-home message is the Western gut microbiota has developed low diversity 
associated with poor health and chronic inflammatory diseases. The MAX can help me, can uh, help retain, can help restore and increase microbiota diversity, which we feel will help promote better immune support, develop a proactive healthcare plan centered around diet or nutrition and lifestyle, and microbiome restorative interventions have the potential to add years to your life and life to your years and hopefully survive COVID-19. References here, and, and I haven't had a time to list all the references for the slides, but I try to always include the main author, the journal published in, year, so you can always look that up. And if you can't find that article, let me know, because I have them all on file. And I always like to end, all, again, all you need is love, but a little chocolate now and then doesn't hurt. A quote from Charles Schultz. Well, thank you for your attention. Again, we're planning a, a, another presentation, trying to put together the science behind some of these issues of immune support as, as we continue to go through this pandemic. And also trying to set up a, uh, a medium, perhaps if you have questions or comments concerning this presentation, you could send it into the college. And then in our follow-up presentation, We'll, we'll do our best to try to address those questions and comments. Thank you.